All right. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Um, so we know that having, let me admit more people into, you know, we can get started. Thank you for being patient with me. So as more people show up, I might have to pause to allow people to join our Zoom meeting. So let's get started again. Thank you for being here. Um, we know that having an effective mentor is the difference between success and failure in many fields. And um, an early mentoring relationship helps mentee develop skill and knowledge build a network, navigate challenges, and develop self-confidence, leadership skill, and career goals. So in this workshop, we will explore evidence-based scientific criteria for what constitute an effective mentoring relationship, including mentoring practices that are culturally insensitive and effective in accelerating um, students in any field. So welcome to Mentoring Across Differences. My name is Lin Wen. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I taught chemistry at NIU since 2016 um, at both the undergraduate and graduate level. And last June, I joined the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning as an inclusive teaching coordinator. Um, although I am new to the professional development field, I have over a decade of teaching experience in higher education. Um, and I'm excited to have you here with me to discuss mentoring across differences. Since we are going to spend the next 60 minutes or so of our life together, I want to uh, find out how diverse we are in terms of our disciplines and expertise. So um, please tell us your discipline and what you hope to get out of this workshop. Um, please feel free to unmute and introduce yourself, or you could type your responses in the chat. And um, Let's budget a few minutes to do this. So let's get to know each other. Hi, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, Christina Abreu, I'm the director of the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies, um, and I'm also an associate professor of history. Thank you, Christina. Hi, I'm, I'm Matt Timko. I'm in the College of Law. Uh, I'm in the library, but I also teach in the law school. Um, I'm hoping to get uh, just kind of, I, I, I've been part of mentorships as both a mentee and a mentor. So I'm actually hoping to get some tips about being a mentor because sometimes I feel like I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so it's just, it's just, I would like to kind of see what you have to say and what others have experienced as well. So just kind of here to learn about everything. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, uh, we all feel that way sometime, right? But welcome. Thank you for being here. And in the chat, I saw that um, Catherine, uh, Catherine, art education, um, interested in culturally responsive teaching and assessment. Okay, I, I may be able to provide you some practices, but we also have other um, workshop that specifically on like assessment and grading. And I will send all that information in the follow-up email to you. Uh, Ryan from English, nothing in particular, looking forward to the idea to do things better. Well, thank you for being here. All right, so I don't think that's everyone. Um, Deborah, do you Hello. want to introduce yourself? Yes, I would. My name is Deborah Tewalde. I work with the Chance Department as the Peer Mentoring Program Coordinator. Thank you for being here. I'm glad to be here. Uh, we have another participant. So we are at the first part where I would like everyone to introduce yourself, your discipline, um, and what you hope to, to get out of this workshop. Cancer biology, pursuing a teaching career. 
and looking for some pointer. Excellent. Thank you, everyone, for being here. OK, so here are a few things that we're going to cover today. Um, just like Matt say, a mentor born or made, right? So um, today we're going to explore together some of the principle um, that guide effective um, mentoring. Um, and then we're going to dive in, explore um, identity, privilege, um, positionality, what are those things and how they shape ourselves and what we do um, in teaching, leading, mentoring. Um, and then the third learning objective, we're going to work together um, to identify some potential barriers and challenges that may face by underrepresented group. Um, and the last one is for um, each of um, participant to start developing a mentorship action plans. So these are the things that I hope we will achieve after um, the workshop today. So the first thing, and these are research-based um, strategy and practices. So um, in any functional relationship, um, we have to have good communication and mentorship is not an exception. So as a mentor, not only do you need to recognize good communication strategy, but you also need to reflect upon these characteristics of uh, effective good communication and you have to practice it, right? So like any skill, we have to practice communication communication skill. So the first and probably the most important thing as a mentor is to identify the different communication style. Um, so I have an activity here that um, I will put the link in the chat um, for you. Um, in this activity, um, I have the instruction here. Let me put the link in the chat for you first. Okay, my slide have a mind of it all. Let me do it real quick. Let's see. All right. So in the chat is the link to a, a communication style inventory. So I want you to take the next three minutes or so, reflect on your personal characteristic as you read across each of the 15 line um, and, um, and to choose the two words that best describe you on each line. So it's a forced choice. So you must select two that best suit you. Um, and after you click submit, your result will display. Um, don't close your browser. Um, or if you have to close your browser, please take a screenshot of your result for your reference. But let's take the next three minutes to go through this uh, communication site inventory and explore and get to know which one is your communication style. If you cannot access the link or have any question, please let me know.
So let's take another minute to, to complete this activity. Matt, did you complete it? Thanks. So this activity will help you explore your communication style and whether they similar or different than um, your mentee communication style or your mentor if you are a um, junior faculty and have a se more senior faculty mentoring you. So after you complete, um, it's been three minutes, so I'm going to try to bring us back here. Um, oh. Ryan, <laughs> I will send out the link in the follow-up email if you want to go back and, and play with the, the inventory a little bit more. So um, no worry. Um, so uh, question for discussion, uh, what quadrant were you dominant in? Um, what, what quadrants were dominant for you? Was it uh, one or was it like two, three? Uh, um, the same score, and how do these results compare to your perspective or your perception of how you communicate, um, particularly as a mentor? I think we have time for a, a few people to share. I'm going to repeat the question here, and I think I have the question in writing as well. So what quadrant would dominate for you? And how do these results um, compare to your perception of your own communication style? So Ryan say thinking what well, almost 50% for Ryan and Christina say 50 on directive, okay. Anyone else want to either, um, let's see, Catherine, fairly evenly spread, but 37% thinking. I think a lot depend on the contact. 40% thinking, 31 collaborating. So perfect. So now you kind of get an idea of your dominant um Area, uh, style of communication. Anna Mary say collaborating and thinking were highest by far. Anna Mary, I think we didn't get to hear you. What discipline um, are you in? Nursing, thank you. Thinking, collaborating, Deborah. Thinking, planning, collaborating, <laughs> zero on <laughs> doing, creating. <laughs> do you want to tell us a little bit how was it compares to and this is just one inventory right it's not like the one it's just one of the one that um many people use um to kind of explore your own uh, communicating uh, communicating side Matt is this similar to what your perception of your communication style? yeah um I, I I would say that I'm I would in, in reality I'm much more of a doer than zero but it's only if i'm forced into if like no one else is making a decision or if nothing's getting done then i'm like okay well someone has to step up but it's not in my nature to be like okay i'm gonna i'm gonna definitely take the lead on this i'm gonna definitely do this let's talk about it more let's figure out a, a consensus and try to find uh what we both want that that's much more my style um in mentoring and pretty much in in any type of collaboration Thank you for sharing that. So whether you are a mentor right now or you are a mentee by a more senior faculty or by a, a faculty because you are a graduate assistant, um, this is the first step. Start thinking about how different individual or different people have different ways to communicate, right? So some people might have similar way to communicate like yours. Some people have completely different um, communication style. So when you mentor them or when you're being mentored by them, um, be aware of the differences um, will help you communicate more effectively. Um, and other communication skill, 
that um, I hope you're going to reflect on and continue to work on or engage in active listening, um, provide constructive feedback, and um, communicate um, effectively across diverse background and ad identity uh, using um, uh, a newfound awareness of, of different communication style. So uh, another principle that guides um, effective mentoring is um, is aligning your expectations. So in your group or in your experience, um, do you co-create a mentoring agreement? Um, mentor and mentee need to establish a shared understanding of each other's expectation from the relationship. Uh, and we know that expectation will change over time. Um, so as mentors, you should plan for frequent assessment and clear communication of the changes in expectation. Um, so the one thing that uh, you could do is uh, to co-create a, a mentoring agreement or contract to establish a mutual benefits expectation um, and align your expectation as a mentor or the mentee with um, the other um, person. So I want to pause here and ask everyone, do you offer a mentoring agreement when you take on a mentee? Uh, and what do you consider um, when you put together your mentoring agreement? Do you consider communication, public speaking, grant writing? Here's a few things that I put here um, for your reference. But I'd like to hear from you. Uh, how many people here offer mentoring agreement or planning to offer a mentor mentoring agreement or any sort of contract between you and, and your mentee? All right, so let's try this. Um, does the raise hand function? Let me see in the chat. I never done this, but does the same like it would be helpful? I haven't done anything formal like this, but this is a good idea. Thank you. Um, so this link that I can put in the follow up email as well as here for you have some um template so that you can uh, use to develop your mentoring contract or agreement. Kathleen said that um, she had done mentoring contract between when teaching a class for high state assessment. Do you, are you comfortable of um, telling our group a little bit more about your mentoring contract? Uh, yes, uh, for education, we have to do an assessment called EdTPA, the Educative Teaching Portfolio Assessment, and I help students prepare for it, but I clarify that the final work is their own. Um, I clarify when I will respond and offer feedback. I clarify, um, let me think here you know, what my roles are and responsibilities and what their roles are and responsibilities, especially because it's a high stakes assessment. I don't want them coming back to me and saying, you told me this or something. I see. Thank you for sharing that. And I got a request to put the link in the chat. So I would do that right now. And I will send the link again um, in the follow-up email, but I will put the link in the chat right now for you. So this resource is have um, multiple resources. Let's see. Can you access the link? So uh, let's see. Yep. <laughs> so the, the resource page have a whole lot more than just the the mentoring contract. But you um, feel free to look in the. Oh. Okay. All right. So 
can I get back to you, Ryan, with more instruction on uh, where to look in there? Let's see, I'm trying to do this multitask. I see, I see, I see. All right, yeah, that link is too broad. So I will send you everyone, all the pretend, um, all the participant, the link to the um, mentoring contract template where you can use to develop your own. I see a lot in the chat. Oh, okay, found it. Good. Thank you so much for putting it in the chat for everyone. So um, this is the step that not only that it's helped to make your relationship as a mentor um, more effective, but it's also have a component of um, um, inclusion, uh, cover um, the equity aspect of it, because um, for students who are first generation um, college student or for student who are a uh, first generation immigrant, they may not know that it's a two way relationship. They may not know that they also can um, expect certain skill set and knowledge to coming out of the, the mentorship. So when you sit your mentee down and talk about uh, creating or co-creating a mentoring agreement, you're teaching your mentee to, to think about their own expectation. And so it would help the relationship um, for you as a mentor, as well as for the mentee. Other principle that uh, would guide effective mentoring um, are assessing understanding. So, um, foster. So, about list all of the first. So, uh, assessing understanding, fostering independence, um, and promoting professional development, which all of those can profoundly impact mentee development and and success. Um, so let's explore how the principle can positively influence the mentee. Um, assessing understanding. Um, as mentor, um, consider actively assess the mentee level of understanding, uh, knowledge gap, and area of strengths and weaknesses. This assessment can be done through regular check-in. Do you have um, research update? Um, literary review? Do you require the mentee, the student to uh, present in group meeting? Um, so there are multiple different ways that you can ensure mentoring um, approach align with the mentee need and learning style and then assess to see whether they um, actually pick up and understand what you're trying to, to help them achieve. So by assessing understanding, you can tailor uh, your guidance, provide rel re relevant resources and address misconception or knowledge gap um, fostering independent, um, effective mentor aim to empower mentee to become self-directed learners, right? Um, and independent researcher. So that's, this can be achieved by gradually reducing direct instruction and encouraging mentee to take ownership of their learning and decision-making processes. Um, as mentor, you can provide opportunity for mentee to practice problem solving, critical thinking, um, and um, decision making in a supportive environment. So when mentor employ various strategy to, to build mentee confident and resilient, mentee can develop ability to navigate challenges independently and preparing them for long-term success in their career. Promoting uh, professional development. So mentor plays a crucial role in facilitating mentee professional development um, and, and uh, career advancement. So this can involve identify relevant training opportunity, conferences, workshop, um, certification that align with the mentee goal and interest. A mentor can offer guidance on building professional networks, securing internship, job opportunity, um, navigating the workplace dynamics and culture. Um, and uh, by promoting professional development, mentor equip mentee the skill, knowledge, and connection that necessary to thrive in the chosen um, field. Um, 
the graduate school here at NIU um, is doing something that I find very helpful, and it's the graduate career and professional de development. So they offer workshop and training to do exactly what we just mentioned here, the promotion promoting professional development for graduate assistant to prepare them for the, their career aspiration. Um, and when you do um, provide opportunity for your mentee, undergraduate or graduate student to attend conferences, um, think about um, how you can make it more accessible, more equity minded in terms of can you provide the fee, the registration fee and the travel expenses in advance um, instead of using reimbursement. And later we're gonna talk a little bit about the challenges, uh, the financial challenges that some students um, may face. All right, the last thing I have here is addressing equity and I just give you a little, a piece of equity, right? Not everybody can afford to go to conference and pay for thing in advance and then get reimbursed. I know of students who pass on really good opportunity because they didn't have the cash on hand to 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 do what um, needed to be done. So, um, how do we engage with diverse perspective um, uh, when we um, mentoring? Um, diverse backgrounds, diverse um, people. So we're gonna spend a significant of our time here. Let's get started. Um, I have another activity for you. Um, I want you to, if you have your phone readily available, you can hover your camera over the QR code and participate on the Padlet. Screen again. Or you can type it in the chat. I just want to hear your perception, your thought on um, what a identity, what a privilege. What a positionality. So fast, can everyone get to the um, Padlet? Is back. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. You oh, you keep trying to get the QR code, it's not working. Yeah, Amira. but I'll keep trying. Okay. I'll oh. keep trying here. <laughs> How about the chat? I just put the link in the chat. Can you click it? I'll try that. It just comes up as a um there's it like my it doesn't come up as a link. It just comes up as a copied um oh, I phrase. See. So yeah. That better. Thank you so much. So let's see, identity, how you define yourself. Part, an, an, another um, participant say part of people's lives that offered them a strong connection to culture and belonging. 
um, who I am, self-perception as well are the characteristic you share with the world, who I feel comfortably being. All these wonderful. Um, okay, let's move on to see privilege, part of the identity that offers social benefit benefit in certain culture, um, advantages an individual or group might have can be based on identity. And then position on not sure I never heard uh, the term before. Yeah, I learned this fancy word last summer when I start working in faculty development. So I'm with you there. Identi my identity in relation with other. So that's good. That's what I were hoping everybody to take a minute to think about the term, right? Um, and um, the no wrong answer because these are your your perception, your your um, your opinion. Um, so I want to get an understand of an understanding of that, a sense of self. Um, privilege ascending in society inherited, not necessarily earned, beautifully said, to be given a head start. Okay. Um, and then on positionality, there's another response. Um, they are where you are located in relation to other social identity. You're all right, but you get all of the good aspect of these term. Um, so let's dive in. So these are the term, um, my background is from STEM. I am trained to be a facilitator for inclusive STEM teaching project. So I adapt the term from the STEM inclusive STEM teaching project terminology. So identity is the social category that represent how a person or group understand themselves to be and how the world may perceive them. So that's why I say all of you were correct when you put all of your responses together, you got this. So these complex interactions describe the quality, belief, look, expression that make a person or a group um, understanding how themselves to be and how the world see them. And then there's a term of social identity. And that's one of the way of naming the complex interaction between how we understand ourselves and how others see us with respect to a major social category. So these identity are socially constructed um, and it can be apparent or not. And it can be shared or kept private, self-claim, or ascribed by other. So um, my identity, I d identify myself as a person of color, uh, a woman, um, a non-native English speaker. So all of these things are visible identity to others, right? Um, and, and a lot of the time we focus on the visible social identity and not so much on the relational or professional identity. So a few of my, um, social identity or first generation immigrant. And you may know that because of my accented English, but you wouldn't know that I'm a first generation um, graduate from college. Um, I'm the first in in my family to, to, to go to college and graduate from college. The first in my family to get a PhD. Um, and then uh, if I didn't disclose, you would know that I'm a wife, I'm a mom. Um, so, uh, the these identity is impact how we see ourselves and how we see our student. Um, so the next thing I want to uh, the next concept I want to visit a privilege. So many of you got this right. It's a group of unearned cultural, legal, social, and institutional rights. So, for example, um, white people in America have more privilege, able-bodied people have more privilege, neurotypical people have more privilege than others. So uh, we're gonna go through the third 
term really quick, and then um, we can have a discussion. So positionality, and once again, many of you got it right in, in, when you uh, participate in a Padlet. So positionality, one social position, a location, it can be assigned or earned, and it's the result of combining various social factors. Right. Um, so, for example, um, here are my assigned position. Um, I am a person of color. I'm short. I'm female. I'm Asian. Those are assigned for me. I can't do anything about it. Here's uh, my earned positionality. Although I'm a non English speaker, but I have a PhD. So I earned the position as an educated person, but that's invisible um, to many people. Um, so um, just think about these things and think about how your positionality grant or limit your privilege in higher education um, and how it is instruct, instruct you to, um, in a way that you mentor your student, whether you recognize it or not. So then in this activity, which I think we're gonna skip, um, but I want you to, I just want one or two of you to kind of um, think about these two questions and perhaps share with the group. Um, when we think about identity, it depends on the discipline where you come from. Like in STEM, nobody wants to talk about who you are, um, um, but who I am, did instruct the way I, I teach in my classroom. So I want you to think about your name. What is the story of your name? What is the history and meaning of your name? And what aspect of your name, your heritage are meaningful to you? And then the next thing I want to invite you to think about is think about your social identity, uh, whether assigned or earned and how these social identity grant or limit your privilege. And if you can think about how these social identity grant or limit your privilege in your discipline. So let's take a minute to think about this question. And then I hope one or two people um, gonna share with the group. All right, I take a volunteer now. Anyone um, wanna share the story of your name or you could share um, your social identity, whether they assign or earn and how they may grant or limit your privilege, particularly in your, your field of study. I don't know the um, <clears throat> any history around my name. But I was born in the late 60s, and Anne Marie was the name of a TV character in That Girl, so I'm not 100% sure I'm not, <laughs> not named after her. Um, but I would say that the things in the, that give me privilege, specifically in my career, I, you know, I'm a Caucasian uh, woman in nursing. I became a nurse when I was in my early 20s, which is, you know, at the time, you know, 95% of nurses at that time were coming out at that, in that, so... Um, definitely had privilege there. Thank you for sharing that. Anna Miri, right? Yes. Yeah, I like that name. It sounds it sound really nice. Thank you for sharing that. So, um, yeah, so like my identity, like I say, first generation immigrant, first generation uh, going to college, I face a lot of challenges and, and um, it's, it forced me to work harder because I don't have a choice. I want to, I want to get out of poverty. I want to learn English. I want to learn um, 
knowledge and skills so that I can have a good job. So I, I because of my experience of overcome the barriers of uh, first generation graduate co uh, from college, first generation immigrant, it's helped me when I design my course or when my um when I mentor my student, it helped me think about those challenges and barrier and create um option or practices that help my student who might be facing the same challenges and barrier to not have to go through um what what I went to. So that's why I think um thinking about your social identity and how they grant or limit your privilege in everything that you do can be very helpful. So now um, I want us as a group to take the next um, two, three minutes to read this case study. And I want to disclose that I, I have plenty of sample uh, of case study um, from, from uh, peer review research paper, but I want, I've been playing with AI. So I try um, cloud, um, an AI um, created by Anthropic. And so I gave the criteria and I have cloud wrote this case study for this workshop. So Sarah is a 23 years old graduate student pursuing her PhD in a STEM field as a prestigious university. As a young Muslim woman and first generation college student, she finds herself in a unique situation position. She is the only Muslim woman in her research group, the only Muslim woman in her department and one of only four women in the entire department. The predominantly white and male dominate environment has presented various challenges for Sarah. While her peers and professor are generally supportive, she often feels a sense of isolation, uh, a lack of representation. She sometimes wonders if her perspective and experiences are truly understood and valued. So here are the questions for our discussion. What are the main themes raised in this case study? And what challenges or barriers might she face due to her intersectional, um, intersectional identity? Uh, if you hear the word intersectionality before, it's I break it down because I didn't have the time to go through that term. So it's basically the intersectional of multiple identity. And how can these be addressed if you were her mentor? If you were um, her mentor, how would you address this? So um, the last question, I I didn't realize I omit. So her mentor name is Dr. Williams. What strategy can Dr. Williams employ to ensure Sarah has the same opportunity and professional directory as her peers? in the research group and in a department. Well, the first question is easier. Do you think Dr. William is a man or a woman? I guess given the context of the um, case study, I would assume that Dr. Williams is a man. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So assume a man. So when I wrote, when I have Cloud wrote this, it's just like I in my head, I was sure Dr. William is a man. And then I read what Cloud, the AI, give me, and I said, there's nothing in here that indicate that Dr. William is a man, right? So it's it's another um it's another thing for us to realize um is Dr. William could be a woman or a man, because there's nothing in the, the case study that indicate the gender. Um, that's good, yeah. We, let's assume Dr. Williams is a man. Who want to answer the first question? What are the main themes raised in this case study? Ryan say isolation and belonging. Yes. 
issue of um, Christina say issue of representation and visibility. Representation. Good. So what challenges or barriers and have you ever had a similar situation where you are the mentee or you uh, you are the mentor of an obvious minority student? Ryan say she might be excluded or feel excluded. Anna Marie have not had that experience as a mentor. Ryan, do you feel comfortable sharing your experience with a girl? I'm um, sure. I mean, I had a student who uh, was a Vietnamese student, a Vietnamese graduate student in a predominantly white department. Mm -hmm. And uh, was also a gay student and uh he just didn't really ever um like get into the group with the other graduate students so it made it a lot harder for him so there was never really any uh like the other graduate students got a lot of feedback from each other or would go out with each other and kind of just you know complain about graduate school and stuff like that but he was very very isolated and we didn't ever i never really got a good ex answer for it. I would say, oh, well, why don't you go to this event or why don't you do this thing? But I, I just, I think he just never felt comfortable doing it. So I don't think I ever got a good answer for how I could support him better. Yeah. Um, Ryan, I felt like you were describing me um, 13 years ago. <laughs> I was that graduate student. Um, but uh, I'm so glad you noticed and I'm so glad that you engage and you ask the question because I didn't think my mentor were doing the same thing for me. So I think the as a culture in higher education, we're shifting, we're changing. So um, thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you so much for doing what you did for that student. And we, we know that is a two-way street, right? The student have to try as well um to learn about the culture um but there's so much um nuances in their uh, barrier um trust me just the fact that you realize it acknowledge it and and talk um about it with your student it helped it's really helped trust me on that um so Now we're gonna go into some strategy that um, that if you were a mentor that you could potentially consider to to help your student. But um, the feeling of exclusion um, is less alarming to me than the act of exclusion because I've seen um, students who were excluded from uh, group study, from group. Um, and, and this is not even group socializing, it's for like group work and they were excluded because they different. Um, so those are more alarming to me. That's where you need to step in and address um, as mentor. So- I have a quick question. Yes. So in that case, does it help if a professor decides to, rather than having students come up with their own groups, if they assign the groups? I mean, is so, that one way to assist with that situation or? So this situation is um, about a graduate student in physics. And I think because the class was um, a graduate level class, it was very small. Mm -hmm. And so everybody kind, kind of worked together as a whole class of like six or seven student. So in that case, I don't think they have a choice to assign group because all of these six or seven graduate students need to take that course. So they take it together. But the mm -hmm. one student were excluded from the group when they were trying to problem solve together. And I think um, what their professor in that particular case um, didn't handle um, 
the situation um, in a way that you and I might do, let's put it that way. Well, even with a group of that size, the professor couldn't even break the group up into maybe even a smaller group so that person wouldn't feel excluded. Yes, yes. We would hope that they do that, right? But mm -hmm. again, um, some people choose not to. And I do, um, so I, I don't disagree with you. I agree with you completely. And that's part of the work that we're trying to do here to encourage people to think more creative about what can they do? What what can they do in a situation like that? But um, we... Yeah, we make those suggestions. We do make those suggestions. Thank you. You're welcome. So, um, so lack of representation, um, and I put lack of respect here um, as well, because sometimes not only students feel this way, but minority faculty sometimes feel this way as well, if they are an obvious minority in their field. Um, and um, so I think validate the, the feeling um, of the student, the feeling experience, um, acknowledge it, validate it, um, help. And then uh, for the lack of representation, you could um, potentially connect the mentee with a broader network of professional from diverse background or from the background that uh, similar to them. Um, other, um, other thing that other barrier and challenges that underrepresented group might face is um, microaggression, uh, we talk a little bit about exclusion um, and then stereotype threat. Um, so with all the, it's really, so on the left column, I have some identified potential barrier. And then on the right column, I have some, um, some something that as mentor, you might want to consider doing um, that might help them. So if, if you are a student, your mentee struggle to find relatable role model um, who share their culture and background and life experience, um, you could help connect them with people who have more similar similarity to their cultural background and life experience. Um, for people who encounter discrimination, microaggression, um, you could validate their experiences and feeling, uh, provide a safe space for open dialogue, and perhaps advocate for an inclusive and welcoming environment in your own department um, or co college. And another thing that I want to point out is the financial and social economic challenges. Um, students from low income or disadvantaged background may face financial constraint, um, making it difficult to uh, accept resources, attending conference or participate in extracurricular activity. So as a mentor, what you could help is provide funding for conferences um, and training upfront instead of reimbursement, if you can, because I know that sometimes that's really challenging and um, although you want to, you may not be able to, but whenever you can, um, considered that because that would help. So by understanding and addressing some of these potential barriers, um, you can create an inclusive and supportive environment that benefit all students. And when it's when something benefit all students, it usually disproportionately benefit the underrepresented uh, or minority student. So let's hear some of your success story. Like, have you had any experience where you successfully advocate um, to for your mentee and help your mentee? Do you have any success story that you would like to share with the group? We could skip that part. 
we um running a little low on time so i might just move on um with the last thing i want to share with you is start thinking about developing a mentorship action plan so um conduct a self-assessment exam your own cultural biases assumption um identify areas where you need to expand your knowledge area of growth and uh, how they may influence your mentoring approach. Um, maintain effective communication. Um, I will send you the link to the different communication styles so you can read and reflect on it more. Um, aligning, um, so co-creating the mentor-mentee agreement and then sit down and start aligning the expectation um, to align your expectation with your mentee expectation. Then continue to uh, improve your assessing understanding of your mentee, continue to foster their independent and continue to think um, about the different way you could addressing the equity with the first step being recognizing it and, and validate your student experience and feeling and then promoting professional development. Um, and once again, the graduate school here at NIU, they put together a very um, growth mindset, professional development program for uh, our GA. So maybe you can take a look at it and then send your GA there um, for professional development and as well as other opportunity to attend conference and training. Anything else you think that you could put in your mentorship action plan that you don't see here? So in the last two minutes, I just want you to think about these question as you leave this session. I want you to reflect on your current mentoring practices um, and what are some changes you like to make with your mentoring practices or policy. And um, what do you think some of the topic raised during the workshop. I just take one remark, one person, if you would share what is the one thing that you're gonna start implementing or do, or what is the one thing, one topic during the workshop that make you think about as you leave this place. I was going to say the, like the communication piece that you started with, wow. um, just to have an idea on understanding yourself, you know, as a mentor and making sure that the mentors have an understanding of, you know, who they are and what they, what their skills are. So that would be, that was one important um, Thank you. piece for me. Thank you, Deborah. Catherine, Catherine say, um, the idea of empathy will promote it in this workshop. Agreement, the, the agreement, yes, um, have co-create a, a mentoring agreement. Thank you so much for spending um, the last six minutes with me. Um, and I will send a follow-up email with um, the resources. I will also send you the PowerPoint slides so that you can use the link there and um and thank you for being here and thank you so much for caring so much about our student and want to do better and help them success i'm very grateful for you enjoy the rest of your day and i'll be here if you have um any question thank you you're welcome Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. You as Thank well. you. Thank you. You as well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.